Hello, and welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, How to Design an Electrical Room with a Reduced Footprint, sponsored by Schneider Electric. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosgis, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology. All right, so here are some details on how to get the most from today's event. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or with the audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting it on your own device or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with the audio or with the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of things to try. If you do need a technician, please type your question in the ask a question box and the tech team will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual user experience questions will be answered in the answered questions box. Please type a question for the presenter in the ask a question box on the left side of the screen. The live Q&A session will start in about 45 minutes and today's webcast is being recorded. So if you need to come back, you'll receive an email within about a week to the on-demand version of this webcast. To achieve your continuing education credit and to download a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of the screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. If you are interested in receiving that continuing education, there's an exam at the top of the screen. The link to the exam will open in a new browser window, so I suggest you open it right now. The link will break when this webcast ends. You'll also be able to access the link in the on-demand version of this webcast event. All right, well, I am now happy to introduce today's presenter, Brant Smith. Brant Smith is Schneider Electric's Power Systems e-mobility leader. He's been involved in power distribution since 1987 and has been an active IEEE member since 2002. Over that time, he's held various roles such as a journeyman maintenance electrician, instructor of electrical theory and equipment, application engineer, switchgear specialist, sales, business development, power system architect, and product application engineer, one of everything. He holds a BS in business, a BS in electrical engineering technology, and an MBA. All right, Brant, take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all taking the time and everybody's busy. Uh, a few things I wanna get out of the way before we get started, talking about the continuing edu education credits. Uh, first of all, you do have to be registered on Schneider Electric's uh, platform and it has to be the same email address you're using for this event. Uh, if you're not registered, it's easy to do, and we'll include the link in the additional material as well as in the chat. If you're watching this as part of a group, each one of you needs to register for the event to get the credit. Uh, you also need to be logged into the webinar individually to get the credit. The platform itself, the My Schneider platform, is also a great resource for engineers, designers, and specifiers. It's a great place to go to get, get support. Uh, there's a community there, FAQs. There's also a lot of tools, everything from, for example, a library of CSI formatted specifications, design tools you know, for layout, calculators, and more. There's also a, a full library of technical information bulletins for you to peruse and get the answers you need. There's also training on the site as well, you know, the on-demand training uh, so that you can you know, learn about the topics you want to learn. Uh, this is also where you're going to go if you want to download your, your certificates. So what are we going to be learning about today? You know, first of all, we're going to be able, you're going to be able to design with new technologies that will help reduce footprint. It's, you're going to be able to describe how equipment or orientation can affect uh, footprint. 
you're going to be able to describe how uh, to leverage different configurations, outdoor configurations to reduce footprint, and you're going to list alternative equipment that can be used to reduce footprint. So why is this important? The three main reasons, you know, first of all, first and foremost is cost, flexibility, and then constraints. You know, it, it makes sense, you know, price per square foot, it's not exact, but the smaller the building, the more, uh, the less the, the cost. It's not just in terms of absolute uh, of materials that go into the construction, it's also uh, lower cooling, lighting, cleaning, maintenance requirements. Um, you know, heavy equipment, for example, if it's removed moved from the building, uh, reduce the, you can reduce the structural support requirements. You know, and from a long-term point of view, a smaller footprint generally lends itself to lower cost. For example, if you have a full-size piece of equipment, it takes a larger access door. You may have to cut a hole through the wall to get to it. From a flexibility point of view, smaller equipment gives you more space for revenue generating equipment. Um, it allows you the ability to expand for future needs. Uh, for example, I had a customer who uh, they had a, a, a set footprint in their electrical room by using several pieces of equipment that reduced the footprint. They were able to leave space on either side for future expansion. Um, and as far as constraints, the way I usually see this, we all run into issues on projects where we look up and say, uh, for example, it may be that we're we're trying to fit something into a space that where space just doesn't exist. An example of this, we had a customer that was redesigned, was uh, renovating a, an old office building and turning it into you know, high dollar downtown condos. The existing electrical room was not sufficient for the modern needs. If we had used metal clad switch gear, they would have had to blown out, uh, would have had to blow out the wall of the of the electrical room and taken out one of their million dollar condos. Instead, we were able to fit greater electrical capacity into a smaller footprint and save them that 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 revenue generating space. Once again, talking about cost, I mean, unless you're talking about something simple like a parking space, the the dollar per square foot costs run anywhere from 200 to almost a thousand dollars. The more complex, the higher revenue generating the space is, the more uh, critical it is for us to minimize the the usage for our electrical equipment and maximize the revenue generating the space available. So we're going to start by talking about location. One of the easiest ways to save space inside a building is to move the equipment outside. Um, and there's several advantages to doing this. Um, first of all, by Moving the equipment outside, we, we limit the impact on the air conditioning. We also are moving you know, equipment that may have a, a personal hazard concerns outside the, the space itself. E-houses are one of the ways that, that we like to do this, especially in the process, uh, heavy process industries. We, this is a very common uh, tool we use. First of all, it allows us to focus that space and design the, the envelope, the e-house itself to match what the equipment needs are to, to a very fine uh, fine tune it. Generally about a 20% space savings. The other thing is we're able to use the air conditioning based on the electrical equipment needs, not based on, on the uh, comfort of, of the occupants. So you can usually reduce your energy consumption the really the biggest advantage we see is that you are essentially building your 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 electrical equipment room in parallel with your construction itself you know not only are you using a factory environment instead of doing it in a chaotic construction zone you know, where you have to worry about losing equipment or equipment getting damaged you also are able to run a lot of your activities in parallel, which increases our, our time to bring in that, that project to market. We also like to move a lot of our large uh, equipment outdoors, especially when we're talking about transformers. You know, once again, air conditioning loads, that's a major reason. You don't have as, as many requirements to uh, 
support the equipment itself. And when you're talking about, about transformers, especially liquid, liquid fill transformers, removing the containment requirements from the building and putting it out, outdoors uh, can have a, a big impact on your project. You know, one thing I've been using for years is equipment orientation, especially when I was with e-house manufacturers, that was, that was our bread and butter. How do we fit more into a smaller space? One of the tools I use all the time, and I have been for years, are modeling tools. Um, you know, whether you're talking BIM, CAD, being able to lay out the equipment room and optimize uh, the, the equipment layout is a huge deal. I, I know, I mean, I do this on my, 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 for my own personal use. For example, because of COVID, when we installed a home office, you know, I used, I used a, a CAD program to lay out my, my office to maximize the use of my space. And there's a lot of things we can do when optimizing space. There's a lot of tools in our toolbox. Uh, for example, you know, back-to-back -back equipment, if you have front accessible equipment, removes the, the need for space behind it. Um, one of the things I, I've done for years is sharing the uh, working space. If you think about an equipment room, you have working space requirements. You also have code requirements for electrical clearances. Those are not additive you can share that space so by intelligently positioning your equipment you can significantly reduce your your equipment layout uh, another area i like to use and once again this comes from uh, heavily used in the e-house world is uh, moving your moving the uh, 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 rear access for the equipment outside the building this does create additional things that you have to consider. You know, for example, you cannot install other equipment out, outside the building there. You have to uh, be aware, aware of, of weather when, when you're actually working on the equipment, but it eliminates the, the floor space from, from your building. Front accessible versus rear accessible equipment is another way that we can save, uh, we can save space. And it's not a one size fits all uh, uh, solution. You know, sometimes front accessible is is a space saver. At other times, it it uh, uh, doesn't help at all. So my recommendation is, when in doubt, reach out to to uh, one of us, and we'd be glad to help you evaluate it. Um, when you look at it, front accessible switchgear typically, in and of itself, has a larger footprint. But the big space savings advantage comes from, from working space. It comes from your rear accessibility. And by re removing that, as you can see off to the, the far right column, it can have a significant impact uh, on, on uh, uh, the equipment footprint. Another area we like to look at is instead of using separate equipment, let's bring it together into a, a single piece of equipment or an integrated uh, piece of equipment. Uh, a motor control center is a perfect example of this. Uh, if, you, if you look at the right, you see how many individual pieces of equipment, and if you imagine all of that having to be mounted to a wall, the amount of space it would take. And contrast that to the picture on the left of the motor control center, you can see how much savings, you know, sometimes up to a 50% you know, space savings just by bringing it together. You know, the other advantage is all of that interconnect wiring. This is all bust or inter internally wired. So it's done in a factory environment, which is generally a higher quality connection. Integrated electrical equipment, uh, it's another uh, uh, way to sp save space. It's not just that it saves space, and sometimes it can actually save costs, but it's also what it does for the uh, aesthetics of the installation. I want you to think about, see the, the two pallets in the middle of, of equipment arriving into, into a job site. You know, first of all, trying to keep track of it and managing that and installing it correctly can be chaotic. And then you have a wall of electrical equipment. You, you know, oftentimes are trying to lift heavy transformers, which at, at their heart are nothing more than, you know, copper and steel, you know, into the overhead to hang, to hang from the ceiling. And you contrast that to the picture on the left where, you know, it's one cohesive, attractive uh, uh, installation. 
couple examples, you know, and these are from from real life. Yeah, if you look at the top one, and you know the all of the you know the stacked transformers and and all of the 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 busy layout, and you contrast that to the picture on the right where it's a much cleaner installation. You know, in this case, the the material cost was actually uh, there was a minor savings, but the big savings came in in the labor hours where we saved almost a hundred hundred hours on that installation. Same situation on the bottom. You know, it's it's a, a, a very chaotic installation, um, and you contrast that to the nice, clean, integrated equipment where, once again, over 100, 100 labor hours saved on, on that installation. You know, so just by using integrated electrical equipment, you know, not only are you you saving space, there's usually a cost savings when you you look at the the labor, and to me, especially on a large project where you have, uh, for example, a, a automotive manufacturer that I'm I'm working with, where they have millions of dollars of panels and switchboards being delivered to the job site and trying to keep track of it and and doing the installation correctly, and you transition that into a an integrated piece of equipment, the the savings for them and the ability to manage that project, you know, is a a profound benefit. Busway is another area where we can save uh, uh, space as well as labor. You know, if you think about it, instead of running individual conduit and cables or going through, you know, through a cable tray to to the loads, if you can run a line of busway and use bus plugs to drop off for each individual load, it's you know, it's a, usually a faster labor saving type of of installation. Um, and it can it can also result in in space savings over having to try to coordinate where the cable tray runs, conduit runs, and and con and, and conflicting with things like your your air conditioning ducting. So, one another area that we look at is can we use compact equipment? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of equipment that has a significantly reduced footprint and. I'm going to take a step back here and say, and, 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 and put a caveat in here, smaller is not always better. You know, in general, some of these solutions are significantly better solution over the, the larger full, you know, for example, gas insulated switchgear over metal clad. However, there are times that you, you have to take into consideration space for, you know, how the incoming cables are coming in, uh, space for your CTs, your metering, your wireways, um, you know, I also like to, you know, having been hands-on early in my career, I like to look at it from the point of view of the guy that's going to have to work on the equipment five years down the road. I, I like, you know, I'm a big fan of our our small footprint fusible disconnect switches, and it can be a great a great way to spit to 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 fit additional capacity into a small space. But I also like to think about, you know, the 275 pound electrician who's uh, whose pinky is as big around as my wrist and having to fit fit into a 14.75 inch you know sheet metal enclosure trying to work on the equipment where if the space is available let's give that guy an extra foot of space to work in one of my favorite tools that i've i've been using for years is gas insulated switch gear um, you know it's it's a Great solution at 27 and 35 kV. Uh, you know, since it goes up to 2,500 amps, 40 k fault current. You know, this is the solution. You know, especially when you're thinking 35 kV, that is a lot of power that is being put out through that switch gear. You know, there are several main advantages to using gas insulated switch gear over over metal clad switch gear. You know, first of all, is is reduced costs. Uh, gas insulated switch gear is typically more cost effective than metal clad switch gear. You know, it has a significantly smaller footprint. Uh, to put this in perspective, at 35 kV, your your metal clad switch gear is going to be roughly four four foot wide by 10 foot deep, single high construction. Your gas insulated switch gear is going to be a, a quarter of the footprint. Now, I, I had a, a application uh, probably 15 years ago where we took a four way split e-house so essentially four separate e-houses bolted get bolted together 
design with metal clad switchgear. And by shifting it to, to gas insulated switchgear, we were able to, to reduce it to a single shippable section. It was a significant cost savings. Uh, probably even more importantly is that the customer was trying to figure out where they were going to put this equipment for their expansion. And it, it made it much easier to fit it into their, their facility. The uh, uh, Another advantage of, of gas insulated switchgear, it's a safer product. The, the failure points have been engineered out of the switchgear. Over 50% of the failure points in metal clad switchgear do not exist in gas insulated switchgear. And it is virtually impossible to have an arc flash. It's touch safe. It's, it's a safer product for our people. Um, and it's also more reliable since most of the, the critical moving components are not exposed to the environment. So taking just a, a typical uh, one main one main breaker four feeder line up a 35 kV switch gear. If you look at uh, metal clad switch gear to gas insulated switch gear, it is roughly one quarter of the footprint. It is a profound space savings, and while it doesn't fit in every application. When we can use gas insulated switch gear, it is usually a safer, more reliable, better product at a better price. So lots of advantages for our customers to design around that technology. Um, and I'd love to talk more about it. As you can tell, it's a area that I love, but that's, a, that's an hour long topic in and of itself. A similar solution, but at 15 and, and 5 kV is, you know, solid shielded insulated switch gear, which we're just gonna call 2SIS to be brief with it. A similar concept where with gas insulated switch gear, you use SF6 as your dielectric, which allows you to reduce you know, the space between conductors and reduce your footprint. 2SIS uses epoxy to get the same effect. Uh, it gives us a, a significantly smaller piece of equipment it gives a safer product because it is touch safe and just like gas insulated switch gear, virtually every, every form of, of uh, arc flash is eliminated. You know, and I will say though, it's not the right application for everything. It goes up to 1200 amps, 25 KA and 95 KV BIL. That is about 80% of our applications. I, I see a whole lot of 40 KA uh, switch gear specified that when you actually look at the fault current, it's below 20. Um, but when it fits, it can have a, a great, uh, be a great product to support our customers. <clears throat> like I said, it's epoxy insulated and it has a, a uh, grounded layer on the outside. So it, it's uh, incidentally touch safe and it's very similar to what you get with a medium voltage cable. You know, you have an epoxy, you have an insulation with a shield on the outside. And from a space savings point of view, as you can see, just it reduces the footprint by roughly 50%. By the way, this is the product that we used in that uh, application I talked about earlier, where they were going to have to blow out the room in the electrical, uh, the wall in the electrical room. Uh, and and take out one of their million dollar condos. This this is the product that allowed them to fit into that space. There's also reduced with metal clad switch gear. Uh, this is full metal clad switch gear. You know it has a withdrawable circuit breaker. It has all of you know the insulated bus. It has the compartmentalization. The difference is instead of uh, uh, instead of being three foot wide, it's twenty foot. 26 inch uh, wide sections. So it has a pretty significant footprint savings. The other advantage is at least with, with our 26 inch wide product is that it is our next generation switch gear. So all of the new technology and, and the path forward is in, in this platform. And when you're looking at, especially with switchboards, using high density metering can, can be a, a game changer when it comes to space savings. I want you to think about a switchboard and trying to put a meter, a separate meter on each and every one of those uh, those feeders versus being able to put CTs on the individual cables and come into a single meter. Also, we have the ability to integrate a lot of functionality into the devices. Uh, if you look at the, the protective relays, 
we have had for years, it, it's, it essentially is a, a PLC uh, in addition to a, a protective relay. So we have the ability to move a lot of the controls and a lot of the automation into the device itself, not only saving the cost of, of additional equipment needing to be solved, but uh, installed, but also um, sometimes all the extra equipment drives up space. Um, our, our newer circuit breakers also have a lot more capability built into them. And depending on the needs for, for metering accuracy, you know, a lot of times you can drive basic metering into a protective relay or a trip unit. And in some cases, you know, for example, with our, our new line of, of low voltage breakers, you know, we, we have 1% accuracy with our trip unit. You know, and that's that's a, a, a big advantage and it's not going to fit in every application, but if you can eliminate a, a power meter, that can not only save costs in the project, but also sometimes that, that extra meter takes up additional space and you may find yourself bumping into an extra, uh, extra section to fit it. And when it comes to, to our data centers, there's a lot of new technologies coming out that can save space. Uh, one of the newer technologies is liquid cooling. Um, instead of letting the heat hit the air and then using air conditioning to cool it, let's go directly to the source and use liquid cooling to remove to remove the heat. Um, it can have a, a smaller footprint in the data center itself, but it also has a huge impact on the system because you need less cooling equipment and all of that cooling equipment takes space. All of the switch gear to feed that cooling equipment takes space. Um, so this can have a big impact on our ability to, uh, on our, our electrical installations. And then we're gonna move on and, and uh, we, we kind of lumped it together to arch architecture, but to me, this is how do we design our system? What are we thinking about or what are we doing? Um, the first thing we can do, you know, as, as engineers, we have a tendency to want to build redundancy into everything. We want to engineer to be as reliable as, as physically possible and think about every possible contingency in the future. But a lot of times, not only does that add cost, that adds space. You know, and an example of that is oversizing your CPTs. Um, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, lo looking at things like, uh, you know, using smaller breaker uh, frame sizes. You know, I have one customer that, you know, they use the maximum breaker frame size and they want that for every single breaker and they'll just dial it down. The problem is you've just, to, to get the same number of breakers in, in that switchboard, you've just significantly increased your footprint. Um, if you, you, you know, also looking at things like, uh, you know, top entry versus bottom entry, you know, are you use, utilizing all, all of, you know, your top and bottom uh, conduit spaces, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we can do to intelligently design our systems and, and still design reliable systems, but uh, not add additional sections to make it happen. Um, one of the big things is switch gear versus switch boards versus panel boards. Uh, it's, it's a very common thing, especially in industrial applications, to see people try to move up a class in, in equipment, and there's an impact not only on cost, but also on, on the footprint of, of the equipment itself. Uh, for example, if instead of using you know, metal clad, low voltage switch gear, can we take that down to a switchboard? If we can move that down to a switchboard, there is a significant cost savings and a significant safe space savings as well. And in some cases, you really don't gain much for your electrical system by moving up into the, the higher rated equipment. You know, another area to look at, do we really need individually mounted mains? And there's sometimes you have to do that, but if you can eliminate that and just back feed a, a main circuit breaker, you can save you know an, an entire section just just on on the main. 
and with automatic transfer switches. This is another area where we can say, now there are times, this is also an area where we have to think about the system. Are, are we, gener are we uh, paralleling uh, with a generator? In that case, a circuit breaker is a better application. There's times that the larger circuit breaker style ATS is the right solution, but there's also times where it really doesn't make a difference and the smaller con uh, contactor is, is better for the customer in their installation. And the other thing, especially especially in this world where we are pushing more and more data out of our equipment, um, not just out of things like our protective relays and our trip units, but we also now have the ability, for example, to put temperature sensors on our bolted connections. I mean, if you think about a lineup of switchgear, your main failure point is either going to be your bus, bolted bus connections, your cable connections, we can put temperature sensors that continuously monitor that 24 seven and watch for temperature rises to, to warn us of a potential problem before we actually have it. But all those additional devices, integrating all of that equipment, um, you know, for example, um, you know, remote operability. If you have to you know, hardwire a, a remote operability panel, that all takes space and adds complexity to the system where you know, for example, newer equipment, our, our newer breakers and our, our newer uh, uh, trip units have the ability to access the, you know, access that device point to point so that it's secure, but we have the ability to use Bluetooth to ac access that device and move the operator away from the equipment when he's looking at it without the additional wiring installed. And arc flash is another area where, if we're not careful, we can significantly add space as well as cost. Uh, now, I will say that arc flash, and, and we do have a seminar on our website. It's a like I believe it's a four-part seminar that goes in depth into arc flash. It is a a bigger question than just footprint cost, you know, or or a preferred method. Um, but how you choose to solve arc flash can have a big impact on your electrical system. You know, avoidance is typically a minimal impact one, um, although <laughs> it depends on if, if, you know, some companies to um, avoid arc flash when their people are working there on their equipment, go with a main time, main type concept so they can de-energize a, you know, part of their equipment. The problem is you now, you now have redundancy in your breakers so you can feed them from other, other sources and you also have the additional uh, breakers for your main and your tie. It it does it adds reliability. It also gives you the ability to to de-energize de de a good portion of your electrical system so that you can uh, work on the equipment. But that comes at a cost, a higher cost in you know to the customer and a higher cost in in space. Prevention is usually a minimal impact on on a, a footprint. With the exception of gas insulated switchgear and, and 2SIS switchgear. In those cases, they do prevent arc flash. And it, as a result, you end up with a smaller footprint, and usually it's at a lower cost to install it. Containment's an area that adds to the footprint. And if you think about arc venting switchgear, it makes sense. If you have a more robust enclosure, and then you throw in all of the, the duct work that's required for that, it just adds a lot of space. And reduction uh, technology sometimes can, can impact it. You know, for example, um, your high speed switches, your ground, your shorting type switches, that adds additional space. It has a big impact on footprint. Um, going to, you know, arc, you know, arc, you know uh, current limiting fuses can have an impact on it. So we just think the, the message isn't don't do it. The message is let's take a step back. Let's look at arc flash from a higher uh, 10,000 foot perspective, you know, and maybe, maybe the answer is to use several technologies and layer, you know, layer passive and active technologies into it so that we protect our people, but we don't drive up project costs, complex a bit, complexity and, and increase the footprint. 
you know, harmonics is an, mitigation is another area where we need to look at it from a 10,000 foot view. Um, if all you have is a couple VFDs in the system, it's probably the simplest way to do it is use filters, you know, go, go to the source, make it easy. But if you have like a, for example, a motor control center full of variable frequency drives, you know, or, or multiple sources driving it, a lot of times it makes more sense to go to a system-wide harmonic uh, filtration approach. You know, it, you know, the individual piece of equipment may have a footprint that uh, impact on its own, but it's a lot less than the overall uh, footprint input, impact of individual filters. Once again, this is a, a topic that goes well, be, well beyond it, and it's a great opportunity to step back and say, how can we design this system better? And then there's the side of it. Um, a friend of mine liked to, to describe it as uh, working in uh, uh, a Starbucks. He loved working in the Starbucks. He hated the fact that he was bumping elbows with everybody, but the access to the restroom, the the mm -hmm environment the the ability to get a good cup of coffee and you know or, or a snack i mean it was worth it for him and so we we kind of run into that when we talk about footprint because sometimes you know for example small footprint fusible disconnect switches uh, there may be a lack of utility down the road when the technician has to work on it however it allows us to fit a great deal more capacity into a small space and at the time it makes sense and it's a, a great thing to uh, to for for us to uh, be support you know for, for us to to install it so sometimes it makes sense and sometimes it doesn't so in summary what do we want to take away from this uh, first of all why is this important you know it, it First of all, it's important to reduce footprint because there's a significant cost savings for our customers. So there's a cost savings in, in maintaining that, that environment, whether it's air conditioning or actual maintain, maintenance itself. There's a cost of the installation and building it. Um, it gives us greater flexibility. And a lot of times a small footprint piece of equipment gives us the ability to, uh, to work around issues in a site. You know, we're able to, uh, you know, for example, when, when I was talking about the gas insulated uh, switch gear uh, uh, application, instead of, uh, instead of a, you know, a 200 foot by 25 foot by, by 50 foot wide four split building, we were able to move it down to a 70 by, by 20, uh, 22 foot wide single shippable building. And when you, especially since uh, with like e-houses, it's price per square foot, there was a cost savings, but the big advantage was they didn't know where they were going to put this equipment on their site. They didn't have space. Um, you know, the the moving the equipment out, we do that all the time with NEMA 3R equipment, but we can also get creative. You know, we can use an e-house and, and move equipment that wouldn't traditionally be moved out of the, and, and move the entire electrical room outside of, of the building. Uh, there's a lot we can do with orientation. And, you know, you know I, I know we have a lot of people on our staff that, this is one of the things we, we do all the time with our, our consultants is we sit down, we talk about the equipment, we talk about specifications, but we also look at the, uh, the equipment orientation and the layout and figure out how we can do it more efficiently. We help our customers with that. The, you know, the use of compact equipment, you know, in most cases, it makes sense. In some cases, you know, it may not. We need to look at it, but that can be a, uh, not just a cost savings, but also a, a huge footprint savings, and then not over engineering our our systems. You know, if we if we use a switchboard instead of switch gear when when appropriate, if we don't uh, if we don't over oversize our our circuit breakers, we can put ourselves in a, in a, put our customers in in a better position. Now we've we've uh, thrown a lot at you today. I know that. You know this this will be available, and you can click on any of these links for additional information. Uh, you can go to our our website and and ask questions there, or you can reach out to to your Schneider representative, and you know we would be glad to talk to you about any of this 
you know, whether it's, you know, gas insulated switch gear, you know, solid insulated switch gear or any of the other technologies that that's, that's what they're there for. All right. Well, this is where I help out, Brant. Uh, thank you so much. That was a ton of information. I do appreciate it. And now Brant will answer questions from the audience. Please type your question into uh, the ask a question box on your screen, and we will get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we do not get to today will be posted online at www. Dot C -S -E -M -A -G, that's csemag.com. And remember to download instructions for in achieving your continuing education or a copy of this presentation and all those references and resources. Use the event resources tab on the left side of your screen. All right, Brant, like I said, we do have a lot of questions. So let's tackle the first one right away. Um, how much more is GIS, that's gas insulated switch gear equipment, uh, how much more expensive is it than AIS? And then two part question, on a project lifetime cost comparison, does GIS score better? And actually the gas insulated switch gear, especially at 35 kV typically costs less. Uh, even at 27 kV, it's it's uh, very attractive. Most people's 27 kV switch gear is based on 35 kV class switch gear. So the cost itself for the equipment, it it just you know it, it it's a better cost. There's other advantages of of it as well beyond beyond the safety, the reliability, and the footprint. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I know in these these crazy supply chain days that we're dealing with right now. I've never seen the likes of this before. This this is insane. You know, we can get gas insulated switch gear uh, delivered far quicker than we can metal clad switch gear. Um, now, what was the second part of the question? Yeah, so this is over the lifetime of the project. Which one scores better price wise? The gas insulated switch gear. Um, it depends on the technology you use. Some of the older technologies have, I I call it plumbing. It it looks like you know, bolted together flanged plumbing. Uh, in that case, you have to worry about, you know, SF6 leakage because you have all those leakage points. Uh, the more modern design, everything's sealed at the factory. So, you know, from an SF6 point of view, you don't have to worry about any maintenance. The other thing is all of your moving components, the majority of that is is inside the enclosure itself, inside that that gas compartment. So it's not exposed to the environment. You know, it's lubricated for life, you know, vibration proof uh, fasteners. It's designed so that you don't maintain it. Now, I know some people like to say it's maintenance free. That's not entirely true. And there are things you have to do. You have to look at it on, on a, a periodic basis, make sure that structurally it's fine, make sure that somebody hasn't run a forklift into it. And by the way, I've seen somebody run forklift into switch gear. Um, you have to, you know, it's it's not a bad thing to examine the mechanism on on a periodic basis, but it's significantly less than uh, metal clad switch gear. And the other thing is, there's just fewer fewer failure points with it. So from a fixing something that's not working point of view, it it just costs less. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, Brent. Uh, this next question, so we're talking about the industry as a whole, and then if you could narrow it down to what Schneider Electric is doing, um, what are you doing to replace SF6 gas with environmentally friendly solutions? So start with the industry and then narrow it down specifically to Schneider well, Electric. As an industry and as Schneider Electric, we are moving away from SF6. Uh, having said that, this is a challenge because SF6 is a unique gas that has, uh, it, it's, it does things for your electrical system that are very hard to repeat with anything else. Now, having said that, we are in the process of, uh, and it's not here today, but it's coming, uh, coming over the next few years uh, of gas-free switch gear. And, and everybody in the industry is moving that way as well. Um, there's a couple of people that are, are using other gases, but those other gases 
honestly, they, they have as many problems in some cases are worse than SF6. SF6, it may be a greenhouse gas, but it's, it's the, it's the wimpiest greenhouse gas I've ever seen. Okay. Excellent. Good to know. And this is a follow-up question for you. So are we talking about the Schneider electric products, not using SF6 or how does that all come together? We, we are moving away from products that use S SF6. You know, so for example, um, our gas insulated switch gear is, um, you know, we, we have a design, we're testing it. It's, it's first being applied in Europe and then it's going to come into the United States where uh, we can accomplish the you know, similar footprint, similar uh, advantages, but without having, having SF6 gas. It just, it takes time to get there. Okay, okay. Next question is a very basic clarification question. Uh, what is an e-house? Ah, I apologize. You are not supposed to use acronyms and in, in things like this. An e-house is a pre prefabricated metal building. It's usually built, it's built in a factory. And most of the time, all of the electrical equipment that is going to go into the e-house itself are installed in the e-house. They're tested. The interconnect wiring is done. So it's I, I, I would love to say that it's plug and play, but I mean, you, you, it's a little more complicated than that. But the idea is it's shipped to the site, it's set in place, you run your incoming and outgoing cables, do your final test, and, and your installation's done. Okay, got it. Um, so let's talk about labor, um, floor space, all that kind of stuff. What, what's the savings there? Um, from a floor space point of view, what, what you really get is an e-house is usually highly optimized for the equipment that's going in it. Um, for example, if you have, um, you know, medium voltage switch gear direct connected to medium voltage motor control, instead of going off front aligned, usually you go off rear aligned. And then that allows us to put other equipment across from the motor control and really shrink that footprint down. Um, so from a footprint point of view, I, I can usually save quite a bit on, on using an, uh, using an e-house. Um, you know, the biggest advantages with, with an e-house, and once again, this is not an e-house conversation here entirely, but with an e-house, uh, first of all, you usually have tax advantages because uh, it has different depreciation than site built, stick built buildings. Um, the other thing is, you know, when you set it in site, on site, and you've done all of that labor, instead of doing equipment installation in a muddy, chaotic construction site, you're now doing that on in a, in a controlled factory manner. The equipment is checked in and checked out. There's quality control, and it's installed by people that are experts at that equipment. Um, you know, not all electrical contractors, for example, are experienced installing, installing metal clad switch gear, where the people doing it at the house are going to be. All right, thanks for that explanation. Uh, the next question for you, can you give an example of when front accessible equipment would take up more space than rear accessible equipment? Oh, absolutely. If, if you are going to have you know, if, 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 for example, you're able to push the, the rear accessible equipment up against the wall and you have rear access panels, you know, you're going to, to use less space. The front accessible, front accessible switch gear in and of itself has a larger footprint. So um, the only time, the time it, it, it makes sense to use it is when you can push it up against the wall and and gain that rear rear access space otherwise. Um, but if you're gonna put it in the middle of a room, you might as well use rear accessible. If you're going to have rear access to it, you, you should just use rear accessible. Okay, okay. So this is kind of a follow-up question. Um, what are some best practices or tips for finding the delicate balance between a small footprint and a comfortable working environment? 
<laughs> um, it depends on the equipment itself. Um, if you know, for I, I like using the fusible di disconnect switches because we can really fit a lot of capacity into a very small footprint, but that is not a comfortable to maintain footprint. Now, let's face it, you're not going to be going into that equipment on a regular basis. This is an occasional thing, but still, you know, having a, uh, I use the, the example of, you know, the site electrician. It's not usually, you know, it's not usually somebody that can fit into a, a something that's just barely over a foot wide to work on it. Let's go with a double wide section. That is a significantly easier piece of equipment to work on. Um, when you look at things like gas insulated switch gear or solid insulated switch gear, you don't have that problem. Every, you know, especially if it's if it's bottom entry, all of your your access is from the front. It anything that like a a trip coil that's that's going to to need to be replaced is is easily accessible on the front behind the the front cover. The the cable connections are are convenient and at, at the front and it's the type of connection we use in pad mount switch gear. So it, it it's all, it doesn't lose you anything to, to use that comp, compact footprint. Uh, it's not, you don't lose any uh, comfort on, on, on it long-term. Right. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, next question, kind of sort of related. Um, Recommendations or suggestions when designing electrical closets? Depends on the closet, how much space and what you're trying to fit in there. Um, when possible, especially if, if we're trying to put a lot of equipment up against the wall, I like using integrated uh, uh, designs or, you know, our IPACs because it just, our IPC2, because it puts everything in a nice tight uh, package it, it eliminates that that chaos of, of nothing but a wall of panels and unistrut, and it uh, uh, usually saves uh, space and installation costs as well. But that also depends on on what that that space looks like and where you're going to put the put the equipment. Right. Yeah. I think it it depends is probably the best answer for most of these. And Got a lot it. quicker than I said. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question for you. Does the integrated power distribution assembly allow for modifications and equipment size increases? It's a very flexible platform. Um, you know, usually, you know, we, we very commonly see it with a, you know, a 40 volt switchboard, a, a, pan, a transformer and a panel board, and that's a pretty common configuration. But we also have the ability to integrate um, lighting controls, HVAC controls, and it's, it's very flexible. Um, it is possible that it might take up more space, but in, in most cases, because of how you're putting it together, it's just a significantly um, uh, it's a, a significantly cleaner installation and usually takes up less space. Now, what what I like to say is you have to evaluate. You have to look at it from a 10,000 foot view and see what's going to, to actually be on an individual case. It, there's there's very few times that it's it's a definitive, it will take less space than this. Sure, sure. Okay. Okay. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about technologies adding complexity. Is there a complexity added to the system by adding these technologies or what does it really change? It depends on the technology and what you're trying to to accomplish. Um, in some cases, that technology is already there. You know, the, the difference is we aren't accessing it and sending it anywhere else. Um, if you add something like, uh, you know, continuous thermal monitoring, you are adding some complexity to the system. There's additional components. You have to bring the Zigbee signals in. You have to go to an a in HMI, you may want to integrate it to something else. Um, but at the same time, that additional complexity can also give you a great deal more functionality. And if you think about a failure point in your, your equipment, your failure point is most likely going to be the, the incoming cable connection, possibly a bolted bus connection. Um, 
and the, the, the consequences of that failure far outweigh any additional complexity. Now, having said that, uh, we all like the, the shiny object and I know people try to push it in. In reality, I like to go with the simplest solution we can because you know, at the end of the day, the simplest solution is usually the most reliable. Yeah, yeah, it is. All right, next question for you, Brant. And I, I wanted to say, if you do have a question for Brant, feel free to type it in. If we do not get to it here verbally, we will answer as many questions as possible in writing. So let's see here, Brant, another question for you. Can we get a transformer with integrated primary disconnect and secondary overcurrent protection? I would have to uh, get back to you on that one. Sure. I, I don't have the answer off the top of my head on that one. All right, we'll come back to that. Thank you. Uh, the next question for you, this is another clarification question. Uh, please clarify what is meant by a back-fed main breaker. A, a back-fed main breaker, instead of having the main breaker separate from the switchboard, it is one of the breakers in the switchboard itself, and you're feeding the, the switchboard through that main breaker. Okay. All right, so here's another question very specific to California. We're talking Oshpod here. Are the gas insulated system and two SIS, have they been used? Are they authorized through Oshpod? Are they, you know, what projects are they in right now? Any? I would have to double check on that to make sure, but I believe so. Um, we're, we're, we're installing both of them and, and we have significant installations and data centers and, industrial facilities around the country. So I would think so, but I don't know definitively. All right, we'll come back to that one. All right, uh, a little bit about lead time. Is there a difference in lead time for integrated equipment versus individual panels or tran uh, transformers? There is a little bit of a difference in lead time. If you think about the integrated equipment, it is integrating all of those things, the panels, the transformers into the equipment itself. So there is time to actually do the integration, uh, but the same lead time constraints we run into with everything else, it's it drives it into the integrated equipment too. Okay. All right, well, Brent, we have time for only one more question. So this one, this one's tough. Um, so let's talk about hot weather. Uh, what is a realistic maximum summer temperature for things like transformers? Because we all know that different parts of the United States are seeing extreme temperatures. I, you know, honestly, I hate seeing, uh, you know, for example, NEMA 3R. I know it's a common thing in our industry and, you know, I'm in Texas. So I see people wanting to install their electrical equipment out in, in NEMA 3R enclosures, and I, I, I cringe a little bit because of it, because of the, the heat, uh, heat concerns. Uh, as, far as, you know, the, as far as the actual temperature requirements, and you, you really have to be, you know, it, it really goes down to what is the maximum temperature in a location, and that varies from, you know, West Texas versus, say, Wisconsin. Um, and the maximum temperature rise in the equipment itself. Okay. There's, there's not a there's not a pretty clean answer to that. At which point you cut off, and it makes sense. Right, right. Well, thank you so much, Brant. That is some terrific information. Um, thank you for those great questions as well. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Schneider Electric, for sponsoring today's event. And now that we are just about done, we want to hear how we did. An exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information for future webcasts. And finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This is now the end of the webcast. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>